We are here with the masters, and I want to kick off this conversation because we only have an hour, and we want to get, we want to hear as much from Ray Barreto as we can. There, there will be an opportunity at the end for some questions from the audience. You have in your programs a bio on Ray Barreto, so we'll skip with the preliminaries, and I'm going to go straight to the chase. First of all, Ray, thanks for being here. You are one of the masters. It's appropriate for you to be here. People want to know about this wonderful uh, career that you've had that has spanned more than 40 albums, fusing jazz, Latin jazz, salsa. You've had some of the best bands around. You've had some great singers in those bands. You have been noted for having always a strong percussion, rhythmic section. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to your days in the Bronx. You were born in Brooklyn, but you were raised in the Bronx. And the good old Bronx, the boogie down Bronx. And I have a friend of mine, a colleague, who's a novelist, Nicolas Amor, who's here with us. And she was also raised in the Bronx with six brothers, and she was telling me that she knew you as a teenager, as a young boy, you hung out with her brothers, you came to her house, and that you were always drumming on something. You were always hitting something, pots and pans, whatever it was, you'd go into a zone, and her mother would tell you, I mean, you were always into drumming. What was happening in the Bronx at that time? What were you listening to, and what led you to the, the drum? Well, uh, <clears throat> the Bronx was, uh, you know, a lot of people come from the Bronx. Uh, when I was growing up, we used to play stickball on PS60. Eddie Palmieri used to play there. Joe Quijano used to play there. Uh, 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 who was a... Uh, the, the guy, the, the timbalero, the young guy. Orlando Marin. Orlando Marin. Yes. The, the, we all used to play stickball together. So there's a lot of musicians, Charlie Palmieri. Um, and and uh, we, we all loved music. At that time, I, I wasn't uh, thinking about becoming a professional musician. I just know that I loved it. And the thing about my life is that I, I'm... I'm 73 years old, so I go back a few years. So we're talking about the 40s, right? When you were growing up? Yeah. It was the and, 40s, but you so had your posse, you had the, the guys? Some of the history that we talk about, I, I got to experience personally, which I'm very, one of the good things about getting a little older is that you see and, and, and witness things that people start to talk about later. One of the drags is that the golden years suck, but that's something else. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, there was music all the time in my house. My mother was a uh, music lover, and she used to put on Daniel Santo, Bobby Capo, Trio Lo Pancho. Uh, and later on, that evolved into listening and becoming good friends with, uh, with uh, Arsenio Rodriguez and and his brothers, Luis and Kike, and, and, and um, so I, I was always around music. And then my mother would go to night school to learn English. And she would leave us alone, me, my kid brother and sister, and she said, portate bien o si no viene el cuco. I don't want the cuco around, you know, so. We all know about the cuco, that yeah, boogeyman. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I used to put on the radio at night, and I, in those days, the Spanish, there was only one Spanish station, and it would go off the air at 6 o'clock. And they didn't play salsa back then? No, uh, no. well, they, well they, 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 it wasn't, it was Latin music, you know. The, they played salsa, Tito Puente, uh, but they didn't, yeah. No, no, the, the, Tito wouldn't even wasn't around then, you know. I mean, I, this was, uh, but like I say, was I hear the singers, Bobby Capo, oh. Daniel Santo, Triolo Pancho, um, Jose Luis Monero, some of the figures that have uh, uh, become part of the, uh, our culture and our history. 
And there was a, a ballroom right down the street from where I lived called the Grand Plaza. And I used to go with my mother and I first started to see the big bands in person, Machito, uh, uh, Marcelino Guerra, a lot of wonderful people that were starting to create this, uh, uh, become part of the history of New York, but only we didn't realize it then. We just went to hear music. So I went in the Army, and I came out of the Army. Uh, in the Army, I was stationed in Munich, Germany, and I heard a record that blew me away. It was the recording of Chano Pozo with, with Dizzy Gillespie, Manteca. And I said, when I go back home, that's what I want to do. So I came out of the Army in 1949, and I bought a little drum, and I went to all the places where, in those days, they used to have jam sessions in jazz, so I used to go play a lot of jazz. But someone heard about me, and I got invited to join the Jose Cruvelo's band. And I spent uh, about three and a half years with Jose Cruvelo, and Santito Colon was the vocalist in that band. So then Santito left to go with Tito Puente. And uh, then Mongo left Tito to go with Cal Jader in California, and Tito was looking for a replacement for Mongo. So he had tried a few people. And Santito, le dice Santito, mira ese chamaquito que estaba conmigo en, con Cubelo, you know, you should try him out. So I went to the Palladium on a Wednesday night. I played with, uh, sat in with the band on Wednesday. And Tito said, be at RCA tomorrow at one o'clock. And we did the first session of Dance Mania, which is one of the classic albums. That, uh, mm -hmm. And, and so I was with Tito the next four years. That, that was in 1957 when you replaced Mongo. I joined Mongo. Tito Puente in 1957. Right? How did you feel replacing someone like Mongo Santa Maria? Uh, or did you... It was a, a big, big shoes to fill, you know. Mongo was uh, one of my idols. And uh, I remember when we used to go finish working at, uh, at different clubs and Tito was at the Palladium. All the musicians would run down to hear the Tito Puente band. And I'd stand in front of Mongo and I'd hear this powerful man, you know, playing you know, and I said, Boy, that's it was amazing to to witness. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I know, I'm doing that, you know, and and I had geez, I, I better get my act together because I you know, I so I spent four years with Tito and uh that was like going to school, you know. It was a very lear heavy learning experience. There was a discipline in that band that you don't see anymore. You know, in the Palladium on Sundays, you couldn't go home after the gig. You had to rehearse. We had to rehearse. So when that, the, the Palladium closed at 3 o'clock, all the people left, and the band rehearsed on Sundays from 3, like, to 5 or 6 in the morning. Then you could go home. <laughs> so uh, and that was the discipline of, of that band, and, and yeah. Tito ran a very tight ship. You yeah, know? today musicians want to get paid for the rehearsals. Oh, what well, would Tito well, have told let's them? Let's not talk about money. <laughs> we're, we're talking about art and, and history. Money <laughs> is another thing altogether. <laughs> <laughs> what would Tito have told someone like that? That would have been too much. Yeah. <laughs> but you were playing with Tito, but you were also so interested in jazz. And was, you were an in-demand jazz sideman. Yes, I was. I, I, I'm actually uh, been informed that I'm no, the most recorded conga player in the history of jazz. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you recorded with Wes Montgomery. Gene Adams, you Sonny Stitt, Lou Donaldson, Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, uh, this is a, a lot the list of goes on and on and on. Yeah. You also recorded, then after, after the Tito Puente stint, you started your own band, La Charanga Morena. After I left Tito, the charanga was popular then. And actually how I started, it was, I, I, it was a jazz label, Riverside Records. They were interested in doing what they called pachanga music. They didn't know much about it. 
The Pachanga craze had started. Pacheco had come in with the Pachanga craze. Charlie Palmieri first started the Charanga, then Pacheco, and and Pacheco particularly became very popular with the Charanga. Mm -hmm. So that's how the record company, Riverside Records, got interested because they saw commercial potential in it. And actually, for a moment, it looked like the Charanga and and music was going to become very popular amongst uh, uh, Americans as well as Latinos. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Oren Keepnews, who was the president of, of Riverside Records, said, you know, do you know any Charanga bands that we record? And I said, look, I've made so many records for you as jazz, you know, let me try to do it with, put something together. So uh, I got half of Pacheco's band and half of Charlie Palmieri's <laughs> band <laughs> and got uh, Hector Rivera to do some, some arrangements. Mm-hmm. And uh, so just, just, just to have fun, you know, mm-hmm. just to have my name on a, an album. Mm-hmm. So we did the first recording with the Charanga band, uh, uh, that came on under, under my name, and you had a big hit, a breakthrough well, that, hit. Not right away, because the, the, we did that one record with them. There you go. We did yeah. that one record with them, and then nothing much happened. Uh, so then uh, I went to Tico Records, and I said, you know, we. I have this Charanga band, and Tito spoke up for me. You know, I said, yeah, he's got, the kid's got talent. You know, Tito's <laughs> like that very, you know, he's a nice boy, you know. So we did a, our first recording at the Charanga Modena, which the gentleman has the cover. And, and the album came out, and it was out for about six months. It was all right. But on the Symphony Sid show, uh, which was the, uh, the most important show other than the Latin radio stations during the day. But at night, you know, he used to have a, a program that went on till 2 o'clock in the mm-hmm. morning, so you could uh, listen to, mm-hmm. to Latin music all night. Mm-hmm. And, and he started to get calls. You know, I'm getting the calls to request to play this, this tune. It was called El Watusi. And I'm living in the Bronx, and I'm hearing this, this record, uh, being played on the radio, I didn't realize that I was in the, on my way to getting a, a hit that crossed over into the American music business scene, mm-hmm. and and uh, and I was just uh, uh, you know playing in the little clubs around New York, and I had a big hit, and I didn't know it. <laughs> uh, but that was my first big break. How and, did El Watusi come about? Tell well, me that story. Uh, you know. Uh, when we used to play the Palladium, uh, I noticed that there were some kids used to get to do a Watusi line. It was a dance at the time called a Watusi. And, geez, I'm too old to do this now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got a little bit of a cold. But, Go but, ahead, give, uh, us, give, us, give us a demonstration. Go ahead, let's, let's encourage him. Da, 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 da. And I, and I saw, and, and you saw it here first. <laughs> so I saw the kids doing this dance, and I said, you know, there's a vamp that goes with those steps, mm-hmm. and then the hand clapping, you know? Mm-hmm. So I went home, and I said, ding, 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 ding. Very simple. It's actually a pretty dumb tune, but, but it's all right. So you wrote uh, this tune, yeah, and... Yeah, and, and, uh, and then after about six months that that album was out, all of a sudden they started to play this tune. So Symphony Sid went to Morris Levy, who owned Tico Records, and he says, you know, you may have a hit on your hands. So they submitted it to all the rock stations in New York, you know, uh, uh, Murray the K and those popular uh, rock DJs and stuff. And they started to play it. The next, as they say, is history. You know? <laughs> uh, now, you were, during that time though, you were also, you did the soundtrack for the movie The Exodus. Who collaborated with you on that? 
Uh, that was pretty interesting. That was a major motion picture. Yeah. And you had the Latin band and you did the soundtrack. Yeah. How did I, that I come about? I used to do a lot of things. I got I got called to do that. I got called to do uh, uh, commercials like for Schaefer beer and and some other things, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, but the Exodus was a major motion picture, yeah. and there was like a little six-eight rhythm there that you were doing. Da 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 da. How well, did that come, ar- well, come about? Well, you know, the, part of my jazz training is that I listen to tunes that are not just typical dancing things. You know, I was always interested also in classical music and stuff, and that used to influence the things that I wanted to do with my music. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a way, it was very frustrating because I knew that I had to play dance music. That's what I was doing to, to, as, to make my living. But I didn't want to expand a little bit and try to introduce new things into, into Latin music. In fact, I used to have a thing when I went with, with Fani and Jerry Masucci. I said, Jerry, one track of this LP belongs to me. I'll do whatever you want, but this one is, you know, I always used to save one track for me. So we did things like Espiritu Libre, or, or we did other out things that weren't meant for dancing, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, it didn't always work, but I always wanted the freedom to, to try to expand the horizons of our music. What was it about the drum in particular? that led you to express yourself on just a drum? Why didn't you pick piano or trumpet? Too lazy. What what was it about the drum? I was too lazy to be a... a, a Discipline, I mean, to to study an instrument. (laughs) Hours a day, I respect... I love musicians who, who put in the time. I just didn't have that kind of discipline, you know. I was never taught to play drums. My, my teacher was the street. My teacher was the competition that I was always confronted with. Whether it was, you know. So I, I used to see Mongo, I used to see Patato, there was another great player at the time, Chonguito, there was somebody, and I said, oh, and I, I became very good friends with, with Arsenio Rodriguez, his brother, so there used to be rumbas in his apartment in the Bronx. I used to, uh, uh, the only Puerto Rican kid that could go there, you know, and they accepted me as, as part of the family. So I was very blessed, but it was a trial and error for me, you know, and, and in a way, uh, I, I wish that, that there are times that I wish that I had paid more attention to, to the technique of playing the instrument. For me, I was always trying to find a way to, if, if this goes this way, why don't I do it this way? Mm-hmm. And, and instead of going this way, that's too hard, I'll, I'll just go like that. And I try to, <laughs> to, try to make it as basic and fundamental and, and, and keep it swinging. Like, to me, uh, uh, a percussion instrument, if you don't groove and you don't provide the foundation for the rest of the band, you're not doing your job. So that was what I really concentrated on. Yet you developed the conga style that complemented jazz, all the jazz players, and you worked in a straight ahead swing content yes. with your conga style. Yes. Was that a, nat- a natural evolution in terms of this just happened the more you played, or did you actually come up with a formula that would mix bebop, jazz, swing with the conga playing? How did that it, happen? It, it's, it's really the simplest, if you use your head a little bit, look, I, and to be technical, it, it, American rhythms, jazz rhythms, they have a dotted eight sixteenth note feel. Uh, 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 jazz, Latin rhythms have a straight eight sixteen note feel. So let me let me show. Like if you got a Latino and it's very it's very now jazz so you can't do because this is a clash of things. So you go and and you can and you feel that kind of a pulse. So I said if I just make it so that I'm playing with another drummer because you're playing with a jazz drummer, so you don't want to get in his way. So you just keep basic time 
And they appreciated that. Mm -hmm. So they started calling me more and more for all these sessions. And, and I learned how not to get in the way of the, of the trap drummer. I you know, see. and yeah. I just kept basic time and just altered the way you swing instead of a straight eighth uh, feel, you dotted eight sixteenth feel. So you were one of the most in-demand side musicians in terms of congas for the jazz field during yes. the time that you had the charanga yes. band. Yes. So you did. So what made you keep the charanga band together and not do your own jazz band? Band. Of course, I love what I'm doing. You, know? you love I mean, Charanga. I'm, I'm a Latino, babe. I love my music. You know. <laughs> but, but I, I, I mean, that's very easy to to, to get a to get to. I used to hate it. I used to tell my guys when we were playing at, at clubs, you know, the course or whatever. And like we finished a tune, and one of the singers would say, Que viva Puerto Rico! And everybody would say, Yeah, yeah. I said, You don't want to get applause just to, to you know, that's a cheap way to, to get the people to, you know, you know they're going to say, Rock, yes. you know. Yeah. So when I say I'm a Latino and I love my music, it isn't intended to, to create applause. It's only one part of who I am, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that. Uh, uh, so. I, I, one of my frustrations is that I, I go home and I listen to Ravel, the WC, or, 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 or Mozart, and I wish I could have done that as well, because the, the, the landscape of music is, 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 is so big and vast, and, and you, when you get close to the end of your life, you realize that you've only scratched the surface of what could be done in music. So here you are, this New Yorican from the Bronx. You have this swinging charanga band. You have a hit on the radio that's a boogaloo. <laughs> and you're an in-demand jazz sideman. Then you go and you join the Fania roster. How did that come about? How did you join Fania? And where, how did things change from there? Well, it, it, when I had the charanga, which I had the violins and flute, I started to feel, you know, I'm getting a little restless with this sound. I wanted, so I was the first one in New York to incorporate a trumpet and a trombone with violins. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then uh, I was with United Artists, and I was very unhappy with United Artists. I thought that they were not the right company company for me to be in. You know, they, they expected more commercial things from me, and I wanted to stretch out. Mm -hmm. So I got out of my contract with United Artists, and Jerry Masucci called me. And I said, well, Jerry, I'm starting a new band. I'm going to have change my sound. He says, fine, do whatever you want to do. To, to Jerry's credit, he always gave me carte blanche, and what, he never was told me what to record. So uh, we went to the studio, and I just got two trumpets and uh, let the violins go, and, and we did Acid, which was our first uh, uh, record in 1967 mm -hmm. for uh, Fania Records. That was so the first my record life I bought. Fania started, you know. And I was with that company for 22 years. Wow. Uh, and then he formed the Fani All-Stars. The first time that we did the Fani All-Stars um, was in the village. What's the name of that club? Or the Red Garter. The Red Garter. <laughs> and we did the, the uh, first show at the Red Garter with the Fani All-Stars, and the place was empty. Nothing happened. And I said, this is a joke, you know, people don't want to see all this, you know. So a year later, he goes to uh, uh, the Cheetah, and he's going to do it again. And I said, nah, and here we go again, another failure. Next, lines around the block. You couldn't get into the place. It was packed. And he, Jerry was a very smart businessman. He had camera crews there. He filmed it and the whole thing, and he made a movie out of it. Our Latin thing. Uh, yeah, and I paid for the windshield wiper in his Cadillac. <laughs> 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 
But during that time, I mean, you, you always had this uh, powerful sound, and you got the name, and I want to know from you who gave you the name, Hard Hands. I was doing an interview with Joe Gaines mm -hmm. uh, on the radio show, and uh, as he was like you, uh, sitting in front of the microphone, and the entrance to the studio was behind him. So as I was walking by, I, hey Joe, how you doing? And I, and, and I said, like, you know, how you doing? And he went, don't hit me with those hard hands. <laughs> and he said it on the radio, and the name stuck. And the name stuck, Mr. Yeah, hard Hands. I, there's no truth to that whatsoever. They hurt like anybody else's hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had these really, really swinging bands during your Fania years. And during that time, um, when you had Oreste Vilato and Oreste left to join, they formed Typica 73, the Kimbos. Then you brought in Tony Fuentes on bongo. You brought in little Ray Romero who recorded with you on Guarare, Indestructive, The Other Road. Yes. And you had this really um, powerful rhythm section going forward. How did that come about? I mean, you picked Little Ray, who had worked in the past with Miguelito Valdez, and, and, and Tito Rodriguez. And, and Tito Rodriguez, and yeah. how, how did you, did you hand pick these people? How did that come about? Well, you know, you play in the street, and you see musicians, and, and, and I always make mental notes of who I think can do this or that. Uh, uh, and I have a little reservoir of, of people who have impressed me. Actually, so how I met Alberto Santiago, uh, um, he was playing bass. Uh, I, I forget the name of the band now, because uh, two things happen when, when you get a little older. <laughs> uh, your memory starts to go, and I can't remember the second thing. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so anyway, Alberto was playing bass uh, with a very you know, the hickey band in, in one of the clubs, and, and but he was singing. And I said, Alberto, I want you to put the bass away. I want you to come in as a singer. Orete Vilato was playing timbale with Jose Fajardo, and he was a, a charanga timba player. It was just very simple, you know, but you don't have to do much of playing a charanga. And I, I said, this, this kid is, has more to offer than just playing time in a charanga. So I used to see different guys, you know, and I, and, and I had the good fortune to be able to analyze their talents. And so I challenged them to be better than what they, and expand their, their horizons. And so it, it worked out that as in the band collectively, we all started to grow together. I'll never forget, we were playing at the Hunts Point Palace. And we'd been together maybe a year, year and a half. Uh, Roberto Rodriguez, uh, great trumpet player, Orete, Alberto. Uh, Renny Lopez was the other trumpet player. Luisito Cruz was on piano. Anyway, we, in those days, they used to have marathon bands where they started in the afternoon. Richie Ray, and then Willie Colon, and then Eddie Palmieri, and then Tito Puente. And, and, those and were so the days. Those, those <laughs> were the, and you could see 10 bands over the course of a day, you know? Uh, so when we got a, our, uh, came our turn to play, I remember people standing in front of the bandstand, and then when we finished, we got a, this huge round of applause. And, and, and we looked at each other and say, fellas, I think we've, we've arrived. You know? So uh, <laughs> nah, it was a very nice feeling. Which concert and then was the, And then the guys in Tipica decided they, they wanted to, to form their own band and stuff, so they, they left in, in 1973. And I had a period of time where I was without a band. At that point, that's when I did The Other Road, mm -hmm. which was like a jazz jazz, jazz kind of a, a, a LP. 
And then again, it was... I, and everybody uh, talked about that because it was such a change for you. Yeah. I remember at the time I was working at Latin New York. Yeah. And when the other road came out, well, what is Ray doing? He has such exactly. a kick-ass band before, and now it, he's doing this. It, it, you know, el bochinche en, en la calle was like, <laughs> oh, se, fue, se le fueron los muchachos, que va a ser la hora, yep. ahora, que va a yep. so that the, was the buzz on the street. Right, the buzz on the street was, what's he going to do now? Yeah. So I... While I was reforming the Latin band, I did this jazz record, and uh, and it's today considered a classic amongst musicians because musicians love that record. But the story was that when they released it, uh, people used to go back to the store and, and give it back and say, "We don't want this. This is not Ray Barreto. This is you know." And and so. Jerry Masucci said to me, don't ever make a jazz record again. <laughs> I know. I know. But I was really just taking my time putting the band back together again. But so you, that's the got you, Tito Allen, Lil Ray, Tony Fuentes. You even uh, had Hector Laveau and Menique on coro? Uh, uh, well, we did the one tune, uh, Hector Laveau and Willie Colon did coro. Uh, they on the did coro, yeah. Well, in my very first tune, the album uh, uh, that I did, the Charanga album, my first album, uh, Tito Rodriguez was on coro. Mm -hmm. So I, I always, <laughs> you know, I, I was very fortunate to to, you know, make friends with so many wonderful people who are willing to be part of my life, you know. Mm. As you know, this program today is dedicated to two great percussionists who recently died. Yes. Mongo Santa Maria. Yes. And Luis Daniel Chichito yes. Cepeda. Right. I want to ask you, when you did the concert, the Funny All Star concert at Yankee Stadium, and they put you to play, did that duo with you and Mongo Santa Maria. Yes. You were a relatively young guy then too. How did you feel about that? I'll, I mean, I'll tell you a story about that. The week before, we had played in Panama, the Funny All Stars. And I hurt my finger in Panama. So when we came to rehearse, uh, like on a Thursday for the, for the concert, and Larry Harlow had written this Congo Bongo and stuff, and, 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 and Jerry, it was a brilliant idea of, of putting me against Bongo. And instead of being, you know, I, I always feel that music should be a thing of playing together, not against, but this became a war, you know, and it was all in the street. Right. It's not a competition, well, it's, it's culture. Not, it's, it, should, it shouldn't be a competition, <laughs> yeah. but they make it like that. They make it like a boxing. I asked... Because that sells. I asked uh, uh, Jose, when, when I walked in, Ramon, digo, I asked Come him, on. is this a 10-round fight or a 12-round fight? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so we, we rehearsed, right? And okay, now the chorus and then the Mongol, you take a solo. Okay, then. then, then. So I said, oh, we just rehearsal, you know? Uh, so, and Mongol start. I said, oh my God, this man is out for blood. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so then I said, okay. Uh, I, I never rehearse well. I, my rehearsals, even with my band or whatever, is to listen. I, want, I, I, I have to be aware of what's going on so I can make my own adjustments and corrections. So then the day of the concert, I went, Jerry sent me to a doctor who punctured my finger. I had gotten pus in my finger. I don't know if you, you saw the film. You see there's some tape on my finger. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the show started, and then they came to that number. And uh, <laughs> the 12th Ryan fight started. <laughs> the 12-round fight started. You know. Uh, I, I was very respectful. Uh, he was one of my original idols, you know, and, and someone that I had uh, long admired. Uh, but I said, okay, this is what I can do, you know? So uh, that, that held up my end, you know? I did what I had to do. People, uh, 
But what happened after that is that as we were going back and forth, the people in, in, in the stands started to come out into this field. How did you feel about and, that? When and, you that's, and that's a violation of the contract because the, the, Jerry signed a contract that no one is allowed on the field. And the minute someone steps over the fence to jump on the field, the concert is canceled. It's over. Uh, so we were playing and kids ran over, you know, and, and, and some kids put a Puerto Rican flag on me and said, and the other guy said, Momo, ganate, ganate, ganate. And Pacheco standing here said, get back, get back to me. <laughs> and and uh, uh, it was really a, a madhouse. And the next thing you know, the guards came and said, no more, the show's finished. And we still had another hour of music to play. Uh, so we never did get to finish that concert. I have a burning question now, my own personal question, which is at that concert, uh, when you take the drum at one point and you pick it up and you start dancing that drum, why did you do that? Was it for effect? or out of frustration, or for some, uh, how, how, I mean, if there was just a point that you just got up and picked up the drum. What drove you to do that? Uh, I had done it before, you know. I mean, uh, but there it was still. And, and it wasn't, and it wasn't, I didn't create that. I, the first person I saw to do that was Patato. Ah. And Patato used to do that all the time. And what I found interesting is that there's a sound that you can get from the drum. It's a bass sound that doesn't come out from your hands. It, uh, if you, there's a real bottom. And you can only get that yeah, sound and, when you. And, I, and, and, and so that sound complements what you do with your hands. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, I developed a technique where I used to put my drum on the floor and I used to go. And I, and I banged the drum, the drum on the floor, holding it between mm -hmm. my legs. Mm -hmm. But at that time, it was just a spur of the moment thing. I didn't even, you know, you don't think about what you're going to do next. You, know? you uh, just do it. Uh, but, you know, I, to the, looking back at it, I guess some people could say it was a creative thing to do, and some people could say it was a frustrating thing to do because, you know, it, it, you were in the fight. <laughs> you were in the fight. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think it, it makes for good storytelling. <laughs> what, what do you consider your best concert? The concert, let's say, the defining concert, the moment that made the defining moment for the Ray Barreto Orchestra. Is there a concert that you remember in that way? Maybe not, maybe not in the States. Hmm? Maybe not in the States. Wherever it was. We did a concert at the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, and the, the gentleman took a chance that, that gave the concert. He says, I'm going to present the two worlds of Ray Barreto. Mm. So he had uh, my jazz band, because by that time I had started working with my jazz band, and he had my salsa band. And we did three hours of music between my jazz band and my salsa band. Anyway, the university of, was filled. People were hanging from the things. They and, were hanging from the rafters. Yeah. And Tita Cured Alonso presented me. I walked out on stage and the, the place was dark and there was a spotlight on me. And as I walked out, everybody stood up and started to applaud. And they stood up for 10 minutes. They, they applauded for 10 minutes. 10 minutes of applause. I, I, what is this all about? What year was that? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe seven, eight years ago. But I got on my knees and I almost cried on stage because I, I, I never experienced so much love. Well, that was a defining moment and it was for the two genres of music yeah. you love, uh, jazz uh, yeah, and exactly. Latin. Yeah, I was able to, to present my life 
my, my, the experiences of my career on one stage on one night, I was given that opportunity. And the people in Puerto Rico just kind of said, you know, you're one of ours, welcome home. And I, man, that, I, that I must just, have been a great feeling. Incredible. Was, was that concert recorded? No, it wasn't. It was not recorded. No, not uh, recorded. So we don't have the benefit of sharing it with but you. But I got a chance to do it again. Uh, where? Uh, at Carnegie Hall, June 21. Uh-huh. This year. Uh, I'm this year. With both bands. Uh. How, how would you, in your opinion, and you're the only one that can answer this for me, how do you describe jazz and Latin jazz? Oh boy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I hate to break bubbles here. I, I, so let me just put it this way. It's my, it's my personal opinion. There's no such thing as Latin jazz. Okay. It's a popular term now. Mm -hmm. And just like salsa was popular when it came out. Mm -hmm. But salsa was guaracha, so montuno. Wawanko, Mambo, Cha Cha Cha. There's a lot of things that fall under the umbrella Bomba, of, of, of plena, salsa. All you know? of that. It's all part of salsa. Right. Uh, jazz is an American product. It's, a his, it's, it's, it's the result of the American experience, starting with the slaves in the South, in the cotton fields, up through New Orleans with Louis Armstrong and King Oliver. And, and that whole evolution up until today with uh, Ornette Coleman and John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, Latin music and the, the Latin rhythms that are now uh, sometimes a part of a jazz thing, well, obviously they're part of the Afro-Caribbean experience. Mm -hmm. So when they come together, for me, the term is, the way I would describe it is Latin with jazz. I think that's a more accurate description rather than Latin jazz. Because mm -hmm. you're playing jazz, which is an American uh, phenomenon, and you're playing Latin rhythms, which is obviously a Latin phenomenon. So you're putting the two together. That does not make jazz Latin. It does not make Latin jazz. It's Latin with jazz. That's my personal opinion. I don't. I get in trouble a lot with, with people who say I'm wrong. But <laughs> back in the day, as you said, the way that a lot of people, a lot of percussionists, including my brother, the way that we really learned about um, this Latin music and percussive playing was really in the street, especially <laughs> the 50s and 60s. This, the 60s when you had rumbas in the park. Uh, the Sunday afternoon Absolutely. jams, right. and people, even Tito Puente, as much as he studied, one of the things he always said, if you really want to get your chops, you can only do it in the street. Absolutely. And back then, the only schools to really go to were Juilliard. They didn't teach Latin music. No. And even the radio stations, the popular radio stations, they didn't play Latin music. They no. played Tito Puente or Machito or yeah. Rodriguez, but it was the trios first, some of the big bands, but they would not play the Latin music that was around. So, like, like today. Uh, like, well, yeah. well, well, I'll get to that in yeah. a minute. But my question to you is, today you have schools. You have schools such as this one, the Harbor, yes. that yes. does teach. Yes. You have the Johnny Colon Music School. Yeah. Where would a young musician go to get those real street chops? There's really no place, gathering ground, for percussionists to go. You know, my son is a, a, a student at LaGuardia, which is a, a music and art uh, uh, high, high school. Yeah. Uh, he's a music student. And he, he, at 17, he's better than, than any kid that I knew when I was coming up at 17. And, but <laughs> the, the conga players today, God bless them, you know, uh, Giovanni and people of that school, they can do things that I don't dream of doing. Mm. They have developed styles and it's like technology. 
it, 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 you know, it's like a Model T Ford as compared to a Mercedes Benz today. You know, mm -hmm. the, the things have evolved, and so music evolves, and teaching evolves, and the ability to to articulate things that that were looked upon as impossible 30, 40 years ago are easy to do today. Uh, but there's something missing, and I try to get this across to my son. You can learn all the technique and all the thing, unless you get out in the street and get your ass kicked by someone else who can do it Better. on another level, level. Mm -hmm. and, and you come to understand that you're playing is, is relaying information, you know? That's information. But playing and saying to somebody, man, that feels good, and that touches my spirit, not, not just my, my intellectual awareness. Now you're, you're conveying art. So there's conveying art and there's conveying information. And uh, what I'd, I'd like to see is uh, um, young artists uh, think in terms of what do I do that isn't just what I learned in school, but what I, the mistakes that I'm willing to take to be something that I am, mm -hmm. not what I've been taught to be. Mm -hmm. And so when I was, you know, when I joined Puente and I said, well, I, the first album that I did with Puente Dance Mania, I tried to sound like Mongo because I was just taking his place. But over the years, I said, I can't do this and depend on this style only. I've got to find out who I am. So over the years, and, and that's why I love playing in jazz, because I, I take a whole nother style altogether. And, uh, and I make mistakes, but it's my, I'm the leader, you can't fire me, so. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you this, because I, I, wa I want to just go through two more questions that we have before we have the audience ask a few questions, and that is, do you feel that the salsa you played, which is the salsa, I'm still calling it salsa for the commercial purposes, but Latin music. When I was working in Latin New York, it was Latin music. Do you feel that that music has become stagnant? The music that you played, the, the Latin music back then of the 70s, do you feel that it's become stagnant because of the new music that we have today, the salsa romantica, salsa monga? Well, How do you feel stagnant. about that? That's stagnant. That's stagnant. Yeah. But not our Latin music. <laughs> no, no, no I, I don't think that what we did re remotely begins to be stagnant, classified as stagnant. It was, it was full of... Energy. Energy and, and life, spirit. And life and challenges. And on stage, you know, when we, we used to go, I mean, if we hated each other with the funny all stars, you know, you'd say we're all buddy buddy. Well, we weren't, you know, but when on stage, let's go kick some serious butt. Oh, you yeah. know? And, <laughs> and it was, um, and today, if you have one arranger, and that arranger's responsibility is to write in a certain way that makes the singer the central figure. Mm -hmm. And so if a guy has studied the trumpet for 20 years and he's got great ability to play trumpet and he can do something to contribute to that, he isn't given an opportunity to. Same thing with the piano. It's just an arrangement that complements the singer. Mm -hmm. And so it's this singer versus this singer versus this singer, and there are no more instrumentalists who are leading a band. You don't, there are no more any Palmieri's that lead a band. There's no young pianist there who's taking a band and say, I'm going to do this. There's no young trumpet players, Perico or anybody else that's going to say, I'm taking it. It's all, it's all the singers that are, that are doing this. And the arranger's responsibility is to write for that singer. So what happens? The individuality and the creativity and the willingness to take chances is lost. Mm -hmm. So it sounds the same. When I was growing up, you knew, if you put on Willie Colon, you knew it was Willie Colon. Oh, yes. You put on Johnny Pacheco, you knew it was Johnny Pacheco. Richie Ray and Bobby Cruz. Richie you Ray and Bobby them. Cruz. You knew yeah. it was Richie Ray and Bobby mm -hmm. Cruz. You know that everybody had their own thing, mm -hmm. and we had oh I, yeah I did. anything you could do I could do better oh yeah take that and, and and it was like you know and 
Competition, All you have to do is hear the first few bars, Competition you know. is good for, the, for, for creating, you mm -hmm. know? And, 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 and showing your individuality, you know? You don't want to sound like the other person. Uh, that's lost today. Mm -hmm. That's been lost. No, but there's a danger too. I, I see a couple of young bands that I, I hear about who are trying to recreate the 70s. Mm -hmm. some, some bands out here that, that you know, that boy, we, we got that 70s sound, that butt kicking, swinging. Well, you don't want to come out and, and what are you contributing to the, the development of the craft? If you're not trying to do something different than the 70s, if I started a band again, I wouldn't sound, want to sound like I started 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. I want to try to sound, come out with something new. I probably get criticized for it, but what the hell, you got to take a chance. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't stand still in the same place, which is why I play jazz now, because I don't stand still. Okay, Mr. Ray Barreto. the audience and I saw someone back there and here so someone way in the back that was standing did they have a hand up no okay let me get him first and then you next sir excuse me sir do you want to come up to the mic please so we can hear you thank you and I agree with everything you say, okay? That's my album on the table there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could say what Sonic was doing. Sure. All right. I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. Let's say I'll be in my media and move. But do, do you have a question, sir? Because yes. we're running out of time. That album right there, the musicians are not listening. Okay, I was wondering maybe you could elaborate on that particular album. Who the musicians were? Who the musicians are. Well, you know, one of the things about that album is that when I did start the charanga, the popular al the popular charangas were Pacheco and, and Charlie, who were sounding like Aragón and Fajardo. They were their role models. Me, I wanted to sound, I wanted to take charanga in, in and do something a little bit different with it. So I got Gil Lopez, who was one of my favorite people, one of the unsung heroes of Latin music. And he wrote the charts, and Gil is very, Gil <laughs> and, and, and he is very hip harmonically. So we took this album and tried to do some different things, uh, except the one dumb thing down there that, that was Watusi, and that's the one that became a hit, so I was stuck with it. <laughs> but there was Gil Lopez, and uh, Wito Courtright, uh, and, and Santito Colon were on vocals, uh, and, uh, uh, there was uh, there's no main singer in Charanga. The two singers that sang in unison were Wito Courtright and Santito Colón. Sir? Yes, he did. Yeah, he was there. When I joined the band, Santito was singing already. Okay. Uh, Sir, come up, please. To become a leader right, of a band, uh, what does it take to become a leader of a band? You know, is it technicality, like you said, or no audacity? <sighs> I, I, you know, I, I don't know, man. I, it's, I never thought, why did I become a leader? I just had ideas and, and stuff that I didn't see being realized by playing for somebody else. I remember when I, when, when I, when I first started my band, and I used to play like for $5 a night, and, and I got offered a, a tour to go with, uh, 
uh, with Lena Horn, she was doing a tour of Australia, and they were willing to pay me $400 a week, which at that time was a huge amount of money. You were living large. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 uh, and I turned it down. I said, I'm now a leader of a band. I, I'd rather lead and get $5 than serve and get $400. Wow. So that was my philosophy all my life. That's true. <laughs> Tommy. What happened to the short collaboration between you and Ruben Zanetti? Because I know that he was with you for one and just That was the Guara they recording. Ruben was with me one album of a short time. Ruben's very very bright man, very ambitious man, Reuben. Uh, I'll I, I tell you what, <coughs> some more that when Reuben was in the band, he came over to me and he says, you know, Ray, I want to write most of the material. I want to be in charge of the stuff. Now, I had been leading my band for over 20 years at that point. I said, I'm not going to turn over my, the <laughs> reins of my band. He says, well, he said, well, I got these two Paulas. And, and uh, what, what's, uh, what's the other big hit that he did with Willie, you know? Uh, Siembra. Uh, uh, Siembra, and said, you know. And he sang those tunes for me, and I thought they were very corny. <laughs> <laughs> what do I know, you know? But, and, and I said, it's not, I, I said, you know, I, I was still into, that was the beginning of the change of music for me, where we started to become more, Romantic and and uh, and th you know like the, the the thing that he did that that was really Mac the knife in Spanish uh, mm -hmm. Pedro Navaja you know Pedro Navaja. I said yes I I need I, I I wanted to keep my the tradition of my band mm -hmm. so Ruben left and he Willie said okay I, I, you know Willie kind of became the Ruben and the Batman and Robin show you know yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I'm, I was too big an ego I couldn't I couldn't give up you know, what I had earned over the years. Let me ask you one last question, and that is, who do you see as being a master sitting in this seat where you are 20 years from now that Ramon and all of us can interview? Do you have anyone in mind? You know, that's a funny word, master. I don't think I'm a master. I think I'm lucky. You know, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I You're just... You're a lucky master. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I, it's very nice to, to, to you know, I, I, I... Do you see I, anyone I, I, young now that I, you I, might... I, 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 I don't know. I just don't know. I don't, I don't have that, that, you know, I, I'm not that much in touch with what's happening uh, uh, amongst young players today. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe Giovanni, you know. Giovanni, uh, Giovanni is yes. the perfect, yeah. perfect, and uh, you could do that now, not wait 20 years, you yeah. can put him there now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Giovanni could go there now, yeah. 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 Okay. Any last questions? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I, what, what are you saying? I don't know if this is a big picture, this is a big picture, what do you feel? Yeah, you know I mean? yeah, right. Right. Do you have a question? A question? <laughs> do you have any advice for the young guys, the young blood that are here? You love it? 
You believe it? Would you rather do that than anything else? Well, then don't let no one stop you. You just right. go ahead and do your thing. Do you have a question? And, Thank you. And the walls are tumbling down. There's no such thing anymore of like, yo vengo de Cuba, o de Puerto Rico, de Santo Domingo. You know, they're geniuses coming from every part. Uh, you go to Europe, and I hear young French kids and, and German kids, and they've been doing their homework. And there's a band in, in, uh, uh, in Holland, uh, uh, man, uh, Manteca. I mean, they, they, those, those people swing. And, 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 and what, what is it? They fall in love with the music. And when you fall in love with the music, you already got half of the spirit in you. Guys. You're the one. Tito Puente, Tito Rodriguez, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. right, right, Eddie Palmieri. Uh, I appreciate that, and I totally agree. Yeah. We can't hear you. Good. I explained my position earlier. Yeah. There's jazz and there's Latin, and sometimes they come together. So it's jazz with Latin, but it's not Latin jazz. Okay, so what I'm saying is almost a little ironic that it's national. Well, that's a label, but see, that's an easy. That, music has falls the same. You, you have the same problems with music that you have selling toothpaste. You know, when you when you have um, when you when you need a tissue to blow your nose. You don't think I need a tissue, you say, I, I need a Kleenex. Kleenex has done such a great job of selling that name that you think that that's the only tissue there is, a Kleenex. There's a hundred other tissues out there you can pick from. Yeah. Thank you. I have just one more question. There's a young man here. I'd like to take the question from the young man, and then we have to end the questions because we have to give them a break, and we have Johnny Pacheco here. So we want to start that. But I like to give an opportunity to the youth, so I'd like to hear what this young man has to say. The mic is yours, sweetie. Go ahead. I just, I just want to know if you play I just want to know if you play Well, I'm a frustrated. I fool around with the piano a little bit, and then that's where I sit to get some ideas when when I write. You know, it. it, it you obviously need something that, that helps you melodically and harmonically, not just rhythmically. Um, and, uh, and when I get a chance, I, I play regular drums. I, I just, I, sometimes I'll sit in with my own band and, and just play drums in, in the straight ahead. Um, but today, there are many wonderful percussionists who can write music, who can arrange music, who can compose music, and they are as much a musician as any piano player in the world. 
just remember that. Be proud of that. That's Let's hear it for Ray Barreto.